Well, greetings. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, and if you are not used to um, worshiping with us live, as it were, in our sanctuary, um, in our tradition, we light an Advent candle each Sunday of Advent up to Christmas Eve. And so uh, today we will light a candle in remembrance of prophecy. So the title of my message today is The Messiah Came as a Baby. He will come again as King. And my text is uh, from Isaiah uh, chapter 9 verses 2 and then jumping over to uh, verses 6 and 7. Um, we will also read Acts chapter 1 verse 10 and 11. Now, as we speak about uh, prophecy, uh, we recognize that Jesus comes first as a baby born in a stable, and the prophets of the Old Testament spoke of that. But then they also spoke, and the prophets of the New Testament speak of him coming a second time, but this time he comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Judge of all creation. Now, in the Old Testament times, we had two types of prophets. There were those that were what we call speaking prophets, and then there were those that were writing prophets. In the New Testament, there was kind of the same thing, uh, but their message had uh, a different emphasis. Old Testament spoke and wrote about the coming of the Messiah, this baby Jesus whose birth we're about to celebrate. Their audience was primarily uh, the Jewish people as a nation, corporately, uh, a whole people. New Testament prophets spoke about the baby Jesus' birth. Of course, we have that in the gospel records, the Messiah. But their message also emphasized his second coming, which obviously has not happened yet. But it tells us about him coming as king and judge. So their message is a bit broader, as was their audience. New Testament prophets uh, proclaimed uh, the gospel, not only to Jews, but to Gentiles, whereas Old Testament prophets spoke primarily to the nation of Israel. And their message uh, in the New Testament is more toward living out the faith. Uh, that is, the teachings, the doctrines, and uh, the truths of biblical um, teaching from Jesus. We call it, or I call it, biblical Christianity. Well, these uh, truths and doctrines and teachings of Jesus, um, Jesus' half-brother, Jude, speaks of them as have uh, has once and for all been handed down to the saints. He says that in verse 3 of his epistle, a little writing just before the, the book of Revelation in, in the New Testament. Now, when he speaks of it being handed down to the saints once for all, what he's referring to is that biblical prophecy uh, was uh, the faith, the teachings and doctrines, was now complete. It does not change. Even from the first century, it doesn't change. God's revelation of himself and, and, and the Christian faith uh, is not fluid. Uh, it, it doesn't change. Uh, humans don't get the change, and although we, we try to change God's message and we interpret it or put a spin on it, but we do that at, at our own peril. So the birth and the life and ministry of Jesus uh, uh, was spoken about by these Old Testament prophets, the writing prophets, uh, and there are over 300 prophecies uh, that speak about Jesus' coming as Messiah. Jesus fulfilled every one of those prophecies uh, completely, and human history confirms that. Jesus is who he said he is. He is the Son of God. The testimonies of the Old Testament prophets uh, is true. So if uh, the words of the Old Testament are true about the first coming of Jesus, that means that his second advent, which is yet to happen, uh, 
he comes as king, that also is true. We won't be able to claim ignorance because both Old Testament prophets, in a little, uh, to a small degree, some of the prophets, and certainly the New Testament, all speak of Jesus coming a second time. Now, as to the Old Testament prophets, I've always been very taken with the prophecy uh, of Isaiah. And the reason for that is that he wrote about seven to 800 years uh, before Jesus' birth. And yet part of his message uh, uh, to the Israelites, the Jewish people, uh, is written in the past tense. Isaiah used this literary technique, if you will, or a literary device to emphasize the certainty of these coming events. He spoke hundreds of years before these events were to happen, and yet he wrote them in the past tense. And then human history confirms that it happened, just as he says. Well, that speaks truth about Jesus' birth, Jesus being the Messiah, but it also speaks about the credibility and the supernatural nature of Scripture. That's why I love the prophets so much. The, 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 my legal training as a young man who went to law school uh, comes out, and I, it, it just proves uh, the credibility of Scripture, especially Isaiah and the timing of his writing and the fulfillment and the fact that one person, one individual fulfilled all 300 prophecies about the Messiah. Well, people can deny the deity of Jesus, but no thinking person is going to deny that Jesus was actually born as a historical person. So if Jesus being born exactly as the Old Testament scriptures spoke, there are two things that follow from that. One, the reliability of the scriptures, of course, as a supernatural book. It was God inspiring these prophets to speak something that they never even saw. Isaiah didn't um, grab this prophecy out of thin air. It was given to him by God himself. Secondly, if the details about Jesus' birth are historically accurate, where he was born, the fact that uh, it was a city of David, Bethlehem, um, it strongly suggests to us that all the promises about his second coming are also accurate. Now, the implications of this for those of us who live in Western culture in the 21st century, 2,000 years later, the implications are huge. It assures us that God is who he says he is in Scripture and that God is faithful. He keeps his promises. So in the midst of uh, what we see in our world, in our country today, this social and political chaos and turmoil and corruption, we have the wonderful assurances that Jesus gave to us, gave to his disciples, but he was also speaking for us in John's Gospel, chapter 14. He said to them that evening, I, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come for you and take you to be with me. So in reading the New Testament, the, um, we see in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, that the second advent, the angels spoke to the disciples. They're standing there on the uh, Mount of Olives, and they watch Jesus go up into the sky uh, the clouds sort of envelop him, and he disappears before him. And these two angels come down and say uh, what is written in, in verses 10 and 11, that Jesus will come again exactly as you saw him leave. And we know that if he came the first time, that it is reasonable that he will come the same way the second time. So, for anybody that has rejected God's offer of forgiveness that we find in Scripture, all the prophecies of his coming 
Uh, but someone who has not accepted his offer of forgiveness, then the prophecies about judgment and uh, punishment uh, should be very sobering. God keeps his promises. Remember, there's a verse in Revelation, the last book in the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 7. And this, by the way, is a prophecy of the Apostle John, who wrote Revelation. He says, this is John speaking. He says, look, speaking of Jesus, he is coming with the clouds, just as the angel said back in Acts. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the people on the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Now, they mourn because they rejected God's offer of forgiveness through faith in Jesus. They denied, some of them, that God even exists. They chose to ignore the prophecies of the Bible. And here he is, right before their very eyes, coming down out of the heavens as he left at least 2,000 years ago. And I suspect it, it will be a number of years before he comes a second time. But what they realize is they made the wrong choice. And now consequences come. If the scriptures are historically accurate about Jesus' birth, perhaps a thinking person would consider that the teachings of Scripture, the other teachings of Scripture, are true. God is our creator. Evolution, it is just flawed. It's not credible science. God is our creator. That We can have a relationship with him now, as Scriptures reveal. We can have our sins forgiven and forgotten because of our faith in what Jesus did for us on the cross. Jesus will come again and take us home to be with him for all of eternity. But without that forgiveness, without faith, we face his wrath and his judgment against our sin because God offered Jesus for us as a gift. And we refused the gift. We denied it. Well, for those of us who are genuine followers of Jesus, this is a great source of comfort and encouragement because we comes from knowing uh, that God keeps his promises. The Bible can be trusted and followed. The blessings that are promised us are real. If the prophets spoke about the birth of Jesus 700 years to 800 years before it happened, and it happened exactly as Isaiah spoke and the other prophets that spoke of it, why would God not tell us the truth about his second coming? Fulfilled prophecy attests to the credibility of Scripture, not only about Advent, about all of Scripture. It, you know, it, it just my rascal mind. What if, humil if, if, if humanity was humble enough and uh, wise enough to accept what God says to us in the scriptures. Can you imagine how different life would be? I mean, the world would still have sin. Christians sin. There would still be problems to solve. But we sure wouldn't have the chaos and the turmoil that we have, the hatefulness that we have now in the world. Well, the question arises in my mind, how credible is my faith? How credible is your faith? in Jesus. And based on the evidence of fulfilled prophecies, your faith is totally credible. It takes more faith, more thinking power to believe that Jesus did not come, was not who he said he was, than it takes to believe the scriptures are true. Because we have evidence. And hist human history confirms that evidence. Both secular and human uh, history confirm the fact that Jesus was born. His teachings, his miracles confirm his deity. Only God could do what is recorded that Jesus did when he was here on earth. 
And again, secular history records these miracles, these very strange events. And Jesus was who he said he was, the Messiah, God's son. Well, there are a couple of things that I want to highlight uh, about the reading from Isaiah chapter 9. Look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 9. Notice the difference in time references. Verse 1, Isaiah says, There will be no more gloom, speaking of when Jesus comes. That's future tense. And then he says, For those who were in distress. He's speaking of the northern tribes of Israel, Galilee, where Jesus came from. That's the past tense. So he goes on and he says, In the past he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Both in the future, he will, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles. Now, Zebulun and Naphtali are two northern tribes of the Israel, Israelites, the Jewish people, that lived in northern Israel, Galilee. And they lived with a, uh, mixed in with a whole mess of uh, uh, Gentiles. So they were not really uh, well received by uh, the Jews that lived in the southern kingdom, especially around Jerusalem where uh, it was almost exclusively uh, Jewish. But the use of that past tense and the future tense, it kind of speaks of God's sovereignty over time, over history. God is ruler of everything. He's sovereign. He's sovereign over the past, the, uh, the present, and, and, and what is yet to come, the future. He is uh, sovereign over the mess we see in our country today. So this all supports Paul's um, instruction to us that we looked at last Sunday, <laughs> to be thankful in all circumstances. Well, verse 2 of chapter 9, Isaiah uses that grammar that I spoke of a while back, uh, uh, speaking of something yet to happen in the future, but speaking in the past tense. He's giving us a message of certainty. That's why he did it. Um, speaking of something in the, in the, that is going to happen in the future, but speaking of it in the past tense was not a, a mistake. He's describing something that was certain. He says the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. The light has shined or dawned. The baby Jesus was born there, but not for 800 years. Isaiah uses that past tense to describe something that happened in the future. He's emphasizing, he's using language and grammar to emphasize the certainty of that. Well, why? Because it was determined to happen the way Isaiah spoke about it, by a sovereign God. He is in absolute control. Isaiah spoke the words of comfort from God to the people of Israel, and thus he's speaking words of comfort to us because we look at it from the lens of history. They looked at it uh, towards the future. Well, the um, prophetic message of Scripture coming from God speaks of the accuracy and the credibility of Scripture. Uh, it kind of strengthens our faith uh, of things hoped for. The writer to the uh, people, the Jewish people in uh, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, in chapter 11, verse 1, as he describes what faith is, that it is something that is unseen but hope for. Biblical hope, as you remember, is a certainty because our hope is in God. He's always faithful. He always keeps his promises. You know, secular humanity only sees life uh, or can't see anything other than the circumstances of life. For a Christ follower, circumstances are incidental. They're irrelevant because the reality is the word of God and that God is sovereign, that God is in control. He always was and he always will be. You know, it's kind of like God determines it, it happens. 
but it happens in his sovereign timing, not our understanding of time. That's the, the kind of the when issue. Verse 6, he says, um, this is what happens in, in, in chapter 9, verse 6. He says, for unto us a child is born, a son is given. That's what happened. We know it happened. It's a historical fact. God allows you to deny it. There's no doubt you can deny that happened. But if you choose that route, you do so at your own peril. Now look at the last phrase in verse 7. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the how of prophecy. In fact, it's the how of all of life. God accomplishes his will, period. No one, nothing can stand in uh, and thwart God's will. That is his sovereignty. So there have been two advents, or there are two advents. The first one's already happened, right? Jesus was born in a stable and laid in a feeding trough, a manger for farm animals. That's a historical fact. The second advent is just as certain. It will happen. It will happen in God's timing, not ours, God's timing. And he will come as he promised in John's gospel to collect his brothers and sisters, you and me, and take us home to be with him. So the question becomes, are you ready for his second advent? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time of year where we celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus. And we recognize that um, he came into a chaotic um, world uh, in the first century. He was born in, in a stable in a land that was uh, occupied by a foreign country and under military uh, oppressive rule. And uh, we live in a, a time that is uh, changing uh, just in the last few years. And uh, we recognize that, uh, that you are sovereign over all of these events, that you knew before you ever created the earth uh, or the universe that this would happen. And so we take comfort in that. And as Isaiah spoke of his first coming, he also speaks of Jesus' second coming, as do the New Testament prophets. Um, we draw from that comfort and encouragement and we look forward to that day when we will uh, be free from this place and be with you in glory. So thank you for these truths and for this time of year. And we ask that you would bless us in Christ's name. Amen. Have a great Advent season.